In case you have the attention span of a goldfish, in this video we're going to be looking at a lot of detail on nose shape aesthetics and surgical changes for African, Hispanic, East Asian, Middle Eastern, South Asian and Caucasian noses for both men and women and the concept of platyrine, mesorine and leptorine nose shapes. If you've seen our previous video on how climate influences your nose shape, then you're likely aware that people of different ethnicities and geographical regions have different nose shapes overall. Part of this shape is a long-standing adaptation to your local climate to maximize airflow while minimizing irritation. But with the world being more globalized now than ever before, heterogeneous societies like the United States and the United Kingdom are made up of demographic minorities of African, Hispanic, South Asian and East Asians among others. That's why it's important to recognize the growing shift in cosmetic surgery demographics as improved economic factors allow minorities to have greater access to expensive but purely cosmetic surgeries. Rhinoplasty, aka the reshaping of the nose, is the most common of these surgeries and so while in the past surgeons have applied a more of a one-size-fits-all shape, whitewashing ethnic features into a typical Caucasian shape with greater nasal prominence, a narrower base and an upturned tip, this has led to decreasing patient satisfaction over the years. Let's take a look at Michael Jackson's nose to illustrate this point. With Michael being born to African descent, his facial features show phenotypic expressions of African features, especially the mid-facial width, the facial width to height ratio, the scleral show, and most notably the very wide chin. Changing the skin color to a pasty white, be it for vitiligo or other reasons, doesn't change his African features. Shortening his naturally wide nasal base to a sharp, upturned point that you see only in people from the coldest of climates doesn't change his dentofacial dimensions. A lot of his insecurity came from the shape of his nose as he had revealed in many of his later interviews and this insecurity is not uncommon in the African American population who naturally have wide nasal bases and high fibro fatty tissue as a climatic adaptation to hot dry air. The issue isn't in getting your nasal shape changed to be more comfortable in your body but rather how your surgeon designs your rhinoplastic changes to suit your ethnic features. In Michael's case, his surgery was when he was 21 to repair a broken nose and the idea of nose shape planning by ethnicity was not a very big concept at the time. When you have a face as naturally wide as Michael's, having a thin and dainty nose greatly harms your proportion and harmony with your other features. The problem then is that a lot of what we find beautiful is actually based on social acceptance. Many rhinoplastic patients do want a more westernized nose because they live in the Anglosphere as a minority. Much of the neoclassical proportions that surgeons are taught were based on Renaissance understandings of beauty which only suit a select few people, even among the Europeans that these standards were developed for. From Farkas's revision of these canons, we can see that they're not very well suited for the African face and nose. Nowadays, surgeons and, well, Kuro Studios uses anthropometric studies based on the target ethnicity itself. So, for example, Middle Eastern values for a Middle Eastern subject, but these are the averages for an average looking population. The most attractive Middle Eastern faces, for example, would have features and values that surpass the average nasolabial or nasofacial angle, which is what makes them above average in looks after all. So, for many surgeons, a lot of it is guesswork and experience. If your surgeon doesn't have a large portfolio of people who look similar to you, then you are at risk of getting a nose that doesn't really complement your ethnic features. Apart from cost, medical tourism, especially for rhinoplasties, is popular because ethnic surgeons who share the same ethnicity as you and operate on people of your ethnicity in your ethnic region will obviously have far more experience with your nose type than somebody who doesn't. From Patel et al's paper, here is a good example of a good nose job. East and Southeast Asians typically have a very flat nasal bridge, which is one of the features that anthropologist Doug Jones mentioned as making their faces appear very neotenous or childlike. The surgeon here has augmented the nasal bridge and has developed a smooth, consistent line through the dorsum, reducing the sharpness of the suppurative break and the suppurative lobule. The nasal base does appear to be left untouched, which is actually quite good because it's proportionally suited in between her medial canthus, and so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Kobo's 2017 paper actually devised a way to categorize the flatness of East Asian noses compared to the sharpness of Northern European ones. 
Firstly, platyrrhine noses are more common in those with African descent or Southeast Asians with small nasal bones, a low radix, a wide dorsum, reduced tip support, decreased forward projection, a lower nasolabial angle, which just means that the nose is more down and facing, and most characteristically a wide nasal base. Next is a leptorine nose, which are more commonly seen in Caucasian patients and Patel et al considers them to be anatomically the opposite of the platyrrhine nose, with a high radix, well developed bones, a narrow dorsum, and a well defined and quite projected tip. They also seem to naturally have some degree of rotation to them, which some may consider unsightly or misconstrue as a deviated septum. Lastly, meserine noses are seen in the Hispanic populations with features in between the platy and the leptorine shapes. The tip is not as well projected and the nasolabial angle is more acute, meaning that the nose is more downturned with an intermediate amount of soft tissue and thickness. According to Kobo, the noses of the world belong to some combination of these three categories. Instead of assigning people by race or ethnicity, it may just be easier for surgeons to classify them by their nasal characteristics. Let's start off with the African American nose. Baker et al's paper in 1984 found that most African Americans did not want their noses to be transformed into resembling Caucasian nose shapes. Some of the most common reasons for wanting a rhinoplasty were that they felt that their noses were too broad or wide. As a result, Rarich and Muzaffar's study on the African patients had defined five goals for ethnicity-specific rhinoplasty. Maintain nasofacial proportions, ensure a narrower and straighter dorsum, so just imagine that the spine of your nose is a bit narrower now, enhancing tip projection and definition, controlling alar flaring, so nostril flaring, and narrowing inter alar distance or shortening the nasal base. One of these challenges is improving tip projection, which is typically quite flat due to African noses having more fibro fatty tissue than Caucasian ones. However, Royal Rich's study, among others, have shown that underneath this fatty tissue, the structure of African noses is actually quite similar to the Caucasian nose in terms of structural integrity, cartilage strength, and cartilage distances. While these noses may have some similarities, African dentofacial features are very different, with a higher percentage of Africans developing bimaxillary protrusion. This gives the chin a retruded look as the upper jaw, or the maxilla, protrudes forwards and makes the nose appear even flatter. We've covered this in depth in this video over here, going over the statistics of how often it occurs and how it affects aesthetics, and in another video we've used Michael B. Jordan in this celebrity analysis. What Patel et al's paper suggests, that in these cases, chin augmentation may actually yield greater aesthetic gains rather than fiddling around with the shape of the nasal projection. This is because we evaluate the face as a whole, especially in the side profile, and so if the chin is heavily retruded or has some kind of dentofacial anomaly, then that's going to draw our attention away from the nose. Another concern that African patients often have is that the nose is too wide and that the nostrils flare out to noticeably large sizes. Flared nostrils are often corrected because they're less common and thus more unusual and noticeable, but the width of the African nasal base is quite normal and is in similar proportion to noses of other ethnicities. African faces, especially for men, are often wider and so the nasal features are also stretched out further too. Most nose shapes follow a 1 to 1 ratio between nasal width and the intercanthal width, but Porter and colleagues suggest a ratio of 1 to 1.25 or even 1.3 as the nasal bases are actually wider. At Coves, we still recommend the 1.1 ratio because Porter's study takes the average of a sample population of, well, average looking people. Attractive African models and celebrities do have a slightly smaller nasal width than Porter's average at 1.1 and so a nasal base reduction or an ala resection may actually be needed. This refers to Spanish-speaking people of mestizo or Latin origins and this group has seen a lot of diversity from European and indigenous descendants. The mestizo literally means a mixture of races and Roxana Kobo 2010 indicates that they share features from European, African and Indian noses. Similar to the African nose, they have a thicker soft tissue envelope with wider but shorter nasal bones with a less projected but rotated tip. They also have a wider nasal base but not as wide as African noses. Hispanic faces in general have a sharper malar eminence, so cheekbones, with a more acute nasolabial angle, so the noses are more downturned, and the base is typically wider than the intercanthal width, with their dentofacial features having greater midface protrusion and a weaker lower third. 
This last dentofacial feature of mid-face protrusion is quite important because it emphasizes the aquiline or beak-like shape of the nose more greatly, which some love and others absolutely hate as making their face appear more bird-like. Hispanic noses also have a slight to moderate dorsal hump, or the hump could just be due to the plunging curvature of the nose and not an actual bony bump like with other nose types. But regardless, most still get rhinoplasty to straighten this bump and this nose contour out. Of the Hispanic noses, there are three groups and as you can see, the Hispanic features are a mix and not noticeably distinct. As the major concern for Hispanic noses is regarding the dorsal hump, a good surgeon should be able to identify whether there really is a hump to flatten or if it's due to the nose lacking forward protrusion and plunging downwards. East Asian noses are quite unique and have been broadly classified as mesorine, being a mix of flat and sharp features very similarly to Hispanic faces. East Asian noses on average have a wider nasal base than Caucasians with greater nose flaring, but as Re 2017 found, the standards for an attractive Asian face are different from the average Asian face, where the intercanthal distance for attractive Caucasian faces is very similar to the inter alar distance for attractive East Asian faces, meaning that your nasal width should sit comfortably in between your inner eye corner of your eyes, otherwise it will throw off the harmony and become overly salient. One notable differentiator of East Asian noses is that they have a remarkably flat nasal bridge, making the face seem juvenile as children share that same trait. Rhinoplastic surgery for those noses is often about increasing bridge prominence to make the face seem more adult. Ung and colleagues put these noses into three groups, bulbous tip, better defined tip and defined tip, with over 80% of Asian noses being in the first two categories. East Asian noses also have a gentle contour throughout, unlike Caucasian faces, which have a defined ridge at the supratip break, and so corrective surgery can either keep this contour or remove it, as some may feel that it makes the nose more snout-like rather than graceful. As we've covered in our East Asian beauty standards video, yes, I know that Lisa is Thai, I've explained why she's on the thumbnail many times, Many women especially opt for a narrower nasal base while increasing nasal tip prominence and maintaining the gentle curve that is ethnically seen on attractive Asian faces. This isn't a mimicry of westernizing their noses, but rather a beauty standard that developed independently from the West since the late 1800s. From Rorich et al, Middle Eastern noses have thicker skin than usual and the healing process can be more unpredictable. The nasal dorsum is characteristically wider often with a dorsal hump, which is what most opt to get removed in their rhinoplasty. The nasal tip is generally more bulbous, resulting in an under-projected and under-rotated tip with an acute nasolabial angle, in other words, downward-facing nose, and often a plunging nasal tip. This also gives the impression of increased nasal length, which can be masculinizing, especially on women. The nasal base width is often greater than what's seen on Caucasians with greater alar flaring present. Middle Eastern noses also exhibit unusually high rates of asymmetry, with Rorich and Mohan finding it in 82% of patients. This unusually high rate of asymmetry makes asymmetry correction and dorsal hump reduction the primary goals of Middle Eastern patients. Nichayev's study took this further and broke noses down by regions, where he characterized the Egyptian nose with wide nostrils, a sharp nasolabial angle, a broad and rounded nasal tip, and wide dorsum. On the other hand, Levantine noses were narrower but more arched with a notable dorsal hump and fine nasal tip. The Turkish nose also had a plunging tip with inadequate projection but with a wider nasal profile and prominent dorsal hump. Assyrian noses were on average larger than the other groups with broad nasal tips but with more upturned nasolabial angles. Kurds and Iraqis had similar features but with thicker skin and the Iranians had more crooked noses but with thinner skin. For many female Middle Eastern patients, the goal is to often improve femininity by reducing masculine nasal characteristics such as a large nose or plunging nasal tip, and for men, reducing asymmetries or deviating septums. Lastly, South Asian noses. This video is already very long, but we have covered South Asian noses multiple times in much more detail here. South Asian noses in one part were similar to Caucasian noses for one half of the population and closer to Middle Eastern noses for the other half. Characteristically, many had a plunging nasal tip and prominent dorsum, but this is quite similar to the Middle Eastern features and so the recommendations are no different. This rhinoplasty patient has a notable supratip break, like you would expect to see on a Caucasian nose, with quite a minimal dorsal hump, so in many ways, South Asian features are a mix of Caucasian and Middle Eastern. 
Unlike most Caucasians, however, the nose tip is often more blunt than sharp and pointy, which some opt to get changed like in here. I recommend that you watch South Asian beauty standards where this has already been covered, and if you're Caucasian, then you should watch this video where Caucasian noses were covered in great depth, going all over the nasal angles too. So there you have it. If you want to learn more about your nose or get an in-depth consultation from our medical team or an in-house plastic surgeon on what type of nose you have, your options and Photoshop morphs or what to look for, then order a Coov's aesthetics report with 24 pages of anthropometric assessment for your facial features or request an online consultation with one of our doctors about a specific area of concern. As always, I also recommend you follow us on TikTok and Instagram to get just as much quality content as you see us on YouTube.